We now want to start talking about a second way to think about torque, and to do so, we need to introduce this concept of the moment of inertia. Now, if you recall, when we had talked about mass, we said at the beginning of the semester that mass is has sort of two different definitions, right? One idea of mass or one concept of mass is the total amount of matter that an object is made out of. A second idea of mass, and this is more to the point of Newtonian mechanics, is mass is a measure of an object inertia and the idea of inertia is that uh, inertia is a measure of the object's resistance to a change in its state of motion so if you recall Newton's first law Newton's first law says an object in motion will remain in motion or an object at rest will stay at rest unless acted on by a force and the inertia of the object is a measure of how the object will respond to that force it's a measure of the object's resistance to change in motion if I have a really large object sliding across a frictionless surface, it has a large amount of inertia and thus it doesn't want to have its motion changed. It's going to take a large force, pardon me, to slow that object down or to cause a change in motion for that object. Likewise, a small object with a small inertia uh, will take um, not as much force to cause a change in motion. And that's what the idea of inertia is. So now we introduce the rotational analog of that and we call it the moment of inertia. And the moment of inertia is simply defined as the resistance uh, of an object to a change in its rotational motion. So if I set something into rotation, uh, its moment of inertia, uh, so if I set it into motion without friction, its moment of inertia is a measure of how it resists a change in its uh, state of rotational motion. How easy is it for me to slow it down or speed it up rotationally, okay? Now, moment of inertia is not just related to the object's mass, although mass is involved, okay? But it is also uh, a measure of how the mass is distributed from the axis that we're rotating about. And so we define the moment of inertia, I, to be the sum of of the product of individual pieces of mass, uh, mi, multiplied by the distance that that mass is from the axis of rotation, ri squared, and we uh, take uh, each of these little uh, products and then we sum all of them up and the total amount gives us the total moment of inertia. So for instance, let's just say that I have a thin uniform and massless bar and I have two solid masses on each end all right and I want to cause rotation about the center so maybe this is like a baton that I'm twirling right at the center okay and um, this has mass m and this has mass m okay and they're each a distance uh, l over 2 away from the uh, axis of rotation Okay, so the total moment of inertia of this object is going to be, and this is uh, sum over i's, by the way. Okay, and uh, you sum over however many i's you have. It can go all the way up to infinity if you make your i's small enough. And we'll talk about what happens uh, when we make our i's small enough. You may have a hint of where this is going. But for now, let's just calculate the moment of inertia of this object. So. Uh, my first mass, m1, is a distance, L over 2 squared, and I'm then going to add to that the product of the second mass times its distance from the axis of rotation squared, and this is going to become m1 L squared over 4 plus M2 L squared over 4. And if my objects have the same mass, then M1 and M2 are the same, and this becomes ML squared over 2, or 1 half ML squared. All right. If I have just one object, let's say I cut my bar in half, 
right? Let's say I cut my uh, baton in half, and I'm only trying to spin uh, this mass about the end, all right? Then we would have uh, just one of these, and it would be uh, m l squared over 4. But in this case, we're taking l to be the entire length of the baton, okay? I should stress that. Okay, now as I said before, you can make your m's, if you have a big blob of something, you can make your m's as small as you want, and when you go uh, from discrete masses uh, into measuring the moment of inertia of a blob of mass, and you're trying to set that blob into motion, you make your m's extremely small, and you go from a discrete sum to an integral. Right? You go from a discrete sum to an integral, and so... This is for discrete. And this is for continuous. Okay? So if I have a uniform, it doesn't even have to be uniform, but if I have just a blob of stuff and it's all connected together, then what I do is I break that blob into little tiny chunks, dm, multiply that little tiny mass by the distance from the axis that I want to rotate it about, and then I add all of those products up and... Uh, that's essentially what the integral is. So let's find the moment of inertia of just a long, thin rod. All right, We're going to forget the masses on the ends. And I want to rotate it again about the center. So again, I'm twirling a baton, but instead of having masses on the ends, I don't have anything. So this is just a thin, uniform rod. Okay. Okay, so I want to calculate the moment of inertia here. And so what we do is we look at a small chunk of mass, dm. And it's going to be a distance x away from the axis of rotation. And what we do is we let from the axis of rotation to one end be l over 2. And this will also be l over 2. Okay, so we're considering the baton, uh, essentially we're cutting it in half, if you will. All right, now, so this is going to be x squared dm, the integral of x squared dm, but how do I relate dm to x so that I can integrate? Well, there's a few different ways you can do it. Uh, one way you can do it is in introduce a new variable called lambda, and let lambda be the mass per unit length. Okay, I'm going to let my lambda be mass per unit length. And this is serving as a one-dimensional density, if you will. Remember that uh, three-dimensional density uh, is mass over volume. If I just have something that's a surface, then I can have density that's mass per unit area. And if I have something that's in one dimension, then I can think of this as mass per unit length. All right. And so what I can say is that my little mass dm is equal to the length dx of my mass, so this has length dx, times lambda, which is the mass per unit length. So dx times lambda would give me units of length times mass per unit length, which is mass, and so I have units of mass on this side, so the units work out, and now I have everything in terms of my differentials. And so, what I can do now is say that x squared times lambda dx from the limits negative l over 2 to all integrated all across the rod to l over 2. And why l over 2? Because again, we need uh, halfway through the rod to be where our axis of rotation is. Okay. And so what does this integral turn out to be? I can pull lambda out of the integral, and this is the integral of x squared dx from my limits, right? And what's the integral of x squared? It's one-third x cubed 
evaluated from negative L over 2 to L over 2. So this is going to be lambda times 1 third uh, L over 2. quantity cubed minus negative L over 2 quantity cubed, right? And so I'm going to start running out of room here. We'll start simplifying things. L cubed over 8 minus, okay, I'm going to get negative L cubed over 8 in here and now my negative signs are going to cancel out so this is going to become plus and plus L cubed plus L cubed over 8 L cubed over 8 plus L cubed over 8 is going to be L cubed over 4 And L cubed over 4 times 1 third is L cubed over 12. Okay, so now I have lambda times L cubed over 12, but remember what lambda was. Lambda is the mass per unit length, so if I take the ratio of my total mass to my total length, then that's what lambda is for a uniform object. So this is the mass over the length, and this gives me L cubed divided by L gives me M L squared over 12. All right, so 1 12th M L squared or R squared or whatever the um, length you use for your particular problem is. So this gives you an example of how to uh, find the moment of inertia of a continuous object um, and that is what the moment of inertia is. In the next video we'll see how the moment of inertia applies to torque.